Hello, and welcome to the Gestalt IT Rundown for March 3rd, 2021, National Cold Cuts Day. So hopefully, if you are of European persuasion, you're enjoying this with a fine slice of turkey or ham. Uh, I am the largest ham that's ever been created. I am Tom Hollingsworth, the networking nerd. And uh, joining me is uh, another fine connoisseur of all things in the deli, Mr. Stephen Foskett. Stephen, thank you for joining us. Hey, Tom. Uh, my favorite cold cut is actually the tofurkey slices. Uh, they are delicious, especially the oven baked one. I know everybody out there is like, what? No, seriously, they're good. Well, if you needed more proof that Stephen is the devil incarnate, tofurkey is it. All right, we're going to go ahead and launch into the set of stories. Uh, it's uh, been, There's been some interesting news coming out, and we're going to go ahead and, and kick it off. But, um, you know, as always, we we scour the internet to find things that are of interest to you. And uh, we're going to start with uh, some cloud news. Uh, Clumio is jumping into the news this week because they are shifting their focus from, uh, or I'm sorry, they're shifting their focus to public cloud backup. Now, the startup, which you may have heard about, has uh, announced that they're going to lay off about two thirds of their sales staff in the move, which is unfortunate. Um, but the reason for that is because they had previously offered on-premises uh, backup software as well as uh, public cloud software. And now they're kind of refocusing that because software as a service is growing much, much more rapidly than any other part. Um, the move signals that the cloud is really taking over the way that businesses uh, do software and the way that they consume it. Um, Stephen, obviously layoffs are never a good idea and we wish those people who are, um, who are heading out well, but what does this mean for Clumio's customers or possibly even their potential customers? Well, I will just remind everybody that the um, SaaS uh, software uh, backup uh, market is huge and growing and the on-premises uh, data protection market is growing, but certainly not as fast. Um, you know, basically SaaS backup is hot. It's a hot topic right now. Um, as you mentioned, you've got a lot of great companies doing some cool things there. Uh, you know, particularly I'm, I'm uh, very familiar with, you know, Commvault's Metallic Enterprise, uh, with Druva, with Haiku. Uh, you know, Veeam just bought Kasten. Um, so this is a pretty hot market. And uh, frankly, I don't blame uh, Clumio for refocusing there. And, um, you know, in terms of the layoffs, um, yeah, I know that that layoffs are bad and they, they really are bad, especially in this uh, economic climate. But at the same time, um, you know, SaaS has a different go-to-market strategy and, um, you know, salespeople and sales support is a, you know, a fickle uh, industry. I, I hope that those folks land on their feet. I, I, I bet they will. Um, you know, they hired some good people. And uh, I think this is a good move overall for, uh, for Clumio, if not for the poor folks who uh, lost their jobs. Um, so Tom, uh, I'm gonna just quickly shift here too to the next story. Um, the next time you're at an airport, uh, you might see a, a new Boingo. Uh, the famous airport wireless provider is, uh, uh, announcing that they're going private uh, in Q2. Uh, they're getting bought out by a private equity firm. Uh, the thing is valued around $854 million, including debt, which I imagine they probably have some of. Um, the company obviously saw a revenue decline. Uh, let's see, you wonder why. Oh yeah, the COVID pandemic and people not flying. Um, and they hope that going private will allow it to shift uh, around and come back stronger when travel opens up again. Um, what's your take on this uh, Boingo story, Tom? So, uh I would tell you my story, but I'm going to need you to add, watch this ad first, and you're only going to, allow to be allowed to hear it for about 30 minutes. That's a joke. Anybody who's ever used Boingo probably is laughing and crying a little bit at the same time. But uh, I, I think that this is a twofold move. So first of all, they were down 10% last year, which 10% down is bad. 10% down in a pandemic for a place that provides Wi-Fi portals to airports is better than we thought. Um, but two... What do you think when you hear company goes private from equity firm? I can hear the cleaver on the cutting board right now getting ready to chop off a lot of pieces of this company. Um, we see this time and time again. Company expands their business to capture investors by diversifying into markets that they really shouldn't be in. Then they get overextended, especially with that magical D word, debt. And then they have to go private to be able to carve off pieces of that without the stock price tanking. So what I expect to see out of this in the next, uh, we'll call it 18 months, is that a lot of the, the fringe cases that Boingo was trying to develop are gonna go away as Wi-Fi becomes more ubiquitous all over the place. 
and people aren't willing to pay for it, as our friend Keith Parsons loves to say, fast, free, and frictionless Wi-Fi, of which Boingo doesn't do two of those. So I think we're going to see the edge cases float away, and we're going to see the core the core piece become more tightly ingrained into other things. And then I think eventually what we're going to see is it's going to be spun off into a separate organization that um, is is well financed and provides healthy profits, but doesn't have all of this other saddled debt, and then it'll eventually go public again. Stephen, uh, Intel is a popular subject here on the news. Uh, we've gotten a lot of things that have been uh, coming around with the uh, recent acquisition of Mr. Pat Gelsinger. However, Intel isn't always on the happy side of the news because a Texas jury has found that they owe $2 billion in damages for infringing on a couple of patents. Uh, the catch in this case, though, which I thought was kind of interesting, is that the company that won this lawsuit hasn't been in business for almost 20 years. You may remember VLSI if you're as old as we are, and you may remember them because they worked with Apple to create the very first ARM processor. Now, you might be asking yourself, wait a minute, why haven't I heard of them recently? Well, it's because back in 1999, they got acquired, and their assets have been traveling to every semiconductor company in the country. But two years ago, the company miraculously rose from its grave as a shambling corpse that's been attached to a holding company as an LLC. And surprise, surprise, they had a couple of patents assigned to them that they then used to sue Intel. Um, in case you're wondering, the patents involve clock speed management, minimum memory voltage, and memory voltage scaling. I know, riveting stuff if you're anyone other than Intel. But it's worth $2 billion, evidently. Um, Intel has said that they completely disagree with the ruling, and of course they're going to appeal, and surprise, surprise, BLSI has a couple of other patent lawsuits pending against Intel. Um, and with $2 billion, I've got a hell of a war chest to pay the lawyers. Stephen, is Intel going to start getting bogged down with a series of uh, zombie patent troll lawsuits? I think uh, companies like this are already bogged down with a series of zombie patent troll lawsuits, and this is just the latest of them. I think that the surprising thing here is, uh, frankly, that it's successful. Um, you know, this is uh, this stuff just makes me mad. Now, I, I got to say, um, I am all for people that invent cool stuff, getting patent protection so that they can, you know, popularize their cool inventions, and um, and and make great products and improve the world. I'm all for that. I'm even all for people inventing great stuff and then licensing their patents to other people so that they can make great stuff and improve the world. But I am not really down with this whole weird situation that we've got in where we've got a, a respected name. So VLSI, I mean, that, this is a cool company. This, this is a company that worked on the original ARM chips that, that actually worked on the original um, you know, Macintosh chips with Apple. Um, you know, this is a company that, uh, you know, we've seen on our motherboards for years and years and years. Well, none of this has to do with VLSI. They're just dragging their good name through it. Imagine if after you died, Tom Hollingsworth sued somebody over patent infringement. You'd be pretty ticked off, wouldn't you? I mean, that's basically what's going on here. So, um, you know, VLSI has nothing to do with this except the name. They got bought by NXP. NXP bought some other people. Those other people had some patents, and then they attached it to the VLSI name, and now VLSI ends up getting dragged through the mud suing Intel and uh, winning. Um, yeah, it just, 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 just leaves a real bad taste in my mouth. And frankly, you know, a lot of these patents, um, you know, I don't want to comment on these specific patents, but a lot of the patents that we see out there are frankly overly general. And, you know, for that, I want to point the finger right back at companies like Intel, because these are companies that are filing patents constantly, what they call defensive patents. In other words, they'll patent anything, anything they can get a patent on. And then hopefully they can use that as a bargaining chip in the future. But the problem is bargaining chips only work when the other guy wants to bargain. And if the other guy is a zombie that just wants to eat your brain, well, he's not so interested in bargaining. So I would not be at all surprised if we see not just more of this, but a ton more of this, especially if Intel ends up writing that check. But that being said, I just add one final coda to this story. I don't expect Intel to write that check. I expect this to get uh, escalated and moved around and eventually some kind of settlement will happen and Intel won't have to pay the $2 billion that they owe some you know, zombie from the Netherlands by way of California. So Tom, um, Malaysian Airlines had a bit of apologizing to do this week, um, as they've had to in the past. Um, this week, though, they announced uh, that customers of their frequent flyer program, known as Enrich, ironically, 
had suffered a data breach sometime in 2010 to th through 2019. Uh, the leak came courtesy of a third party IT contractor. The airline claims that uh, personal information such as names and contact information along with frequent flyer numbers was exposed, but travel and itinerary data is not believed to be affected. Um, how could Malaysia Airlines miss a breach um, you know, this breach uh, was, uh, what, let's see, um, that's 10 years. How did they miss that? Um, that's easy. Not paying attention and relying on other people to assume that they were doing what they were supposed to do. Now, in the fairness of everything, on a scale of not super important to nuclear launch codes, this is probably closer to the not super important scale. It was, it was some PII with some basic stuff, but like they didn't get salted password hashes and all kinds of other stuff. We know that there were some other um, social media apps that were hacked last week where they got all kinds of data because of a massive mess up. This was a third party contractor that probably didn't configure proper permissions and expose something that they shouldn't. And over the course of 10 years, I can probably mine a lot of data. Was it 10 years? Probably not. What Malaysia is probably doing because this is kind of a mandated reporting thing is basically saying, we hired this contractor 10 years ago. We don't know when they made the mistake. We think it could have been exposed this long. We think this is what got shown to the public. Just be aware of that. Um, I would rather know and like make a little hay about it than find out later that, oh yeah, they've been in your systems for 10 years, mining your data and doing all kinds of other stuff. So this is one of those kinds of, I expect to see reports like this regularly. And quite honestly, in today's climate, if I don't see that you've been breached or that, that people have been poking around, I really begin to worry. All right, um, Stephen, one uh, final story here on the top of the news uh, that just kind of came out, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, NetApp, Storage Titan, is transforming their Element OS, which was part of the SolidFire acquisition back in 2015, into a software only approach. Um, it's gonna be called Astra. And it's going to be a Kubernetes-ready, cloudy piece of kit. Um, since NetApp was the poster boy for this whole idea of disaggregated HCI, what does this shift in strategy mean for NetApp HCI customers and really for HCI in general? Yeah, I think this is an interesting uh, story simply because, um, well, from what I hear, you know, the reason that NetApp bought SolidFire had more to do with uh, their HCI approach than it did with their, um, you know, storage systems. And, uh, you know, NetApp and SolidFire for a while, it looked like SolidFire was kind of, you know, eating NetApp. Um, then um, seems like the SolidFire uh, solution has sort of, uh, I don't want to say been sidelined, but been uh, de-emphasized. You know, NetApp is uh, certainly focused on the core uh, products that they've offered for a long time. And frankly, those products are doing really well. Uh, the company just released numbers. We're not a big numbers group here, but uh, NetApp's numbers are good um, from their traditional, you know, storage products. And, um, you know, frankly, uh, looks like the HCI product never really found a foothold. So my feeling is that um, the story here is basically, um, you know, the solid fire stuff just didn't end up trans being as transformative and accretive as NetApp had hoped. And they're moving on to a new product. Um, we don't know a lot about Astra. Um, I'm hoping that we'll learn more. Um, just a little plug here. Uh, we're gonna hear from NetApp um, at our Cloud Field Day event next week. Um, I would encourage people to tune in. Maybe they'll be talking about this there. Um, if not, uh, we'll certainly ask them about it. Uh, you know, what is this? Uh, you know, how does it relate to containers and Kubernetes and public cloud and hybrid cloud? And how does this replace HCI? I would love to know the answers to those things. Um, clearly, that's the, the, the message, though, from NetApp is that, uh, you know, the SolidFire HCI stuff uh, just didn't, you know, find a foothold and now they're trying a different approach. Um, if that's what's going on, honestly, I applaud them because, frankly, what happens when a product doesn't succeed is not that you just pour more money on the fire, uh, but, you know, you got to build what customers want. And, um, you know, frankly, in the cloud, NetApp has been building what customers want. Customers like what they're doing in the cloud. And um, I would be very happy to see them uh, double down on that strategy, which is a progressive forward thinking strategy, instead of just trying to fight the HCI wars of uh, previous years. So honestly, this all looks fine to me. I wouldn't be too, too worried. Um, I, just, uh, I just miss going to visit SolidFire in, in Boulder.
yeah, I kind of feel the same way. And, uh, you know, best of luck to NetApp and their strategy, um, simply because, like you said, I, I would rather them say this isn't working and let's fix it than try to drag it out long enough to make people care about it. All right, Stephen, a couple stories that we wanted to focus on but are a little bit more of a deep dive. Um, first is an acquisition. Um, HPE is going to be picking up cloud physics. Uh, the company announced the acquisition of this AI hybrid cloud assessment platform last week. Uh, cloud physics was already being offered through HP partners um, as a way to do assessments, and the feedback was overwhelmingly positive. So positive, in fact, that HPE said, why don't we just bring you into the house? Now, the crown jewel, according to most analysts for this acquisition, is the cloud physics data lake, which is estimated to hold around 200 trillion, with a T, entries on the over 1 million virtual machines that cloud physics has data on. So they've been collecting data for a while. Now, HPE is looking to integrate this data lake with the InfoSight data lake that they've had ever since they acquired Nimble Storage that uh, they're using as a predictive analytics tool to provide data for their algorithms to crunch on and provide better analysis and management capabilities and all that other good related data stuff that needs AI to help you figure it out. Um, the uh, customers, you know, they're both on-prem and in the cloud. So there's a, there's a lot of synergy there for these hybrid types of applications. Um, Steven, you're the AI guy around here. And obviously you've been following all of the companies involved here for a very long time. What's your take on HPE picking up another analytics company to integrate into this giant, well, can we call it a data ocean yet? Yeah, at least it's a data sea. How's that? Yeah, this is, um, honestly, this is great. Um, I just want to say, uh, way to go HP, uh, because cloud physics um, well, that was a great product. It's very rare that you find an enterprise IT product that is loved as much as cloud physics. But let me just tell you, in the past, I've seen that happen a few times um, with customers. Uh, customers loved Solid Fire. Customers loved Nimble Storage. Customers um, you know, loved Compellent. There were a bunch of companies like that in the past that customers just loved. Solid Fire was one of them, or uh, Cloud Physics was one of them. This is a company that basically made um, a platform that kind of, I don't want to say did your job for you, but really helped you do your job as a day-to-day -day administrator of IT systems. Well, that's kind of the remit of InfoSight within, uh, within HPE. The problem is that InfoSight has always seemed a little storagey. Um, and, and no surprise. I mean, it was developed for, um, you know, nimble storage arrays. Um, and, and not only that, but storage is pretty frankly the best and most important part of any IT environment. So I'm not totally surprised uh, that, uh, you know, th that, that it felt that way. Cloud physics never felt a little storagey. It always felt 100% focused on the servers. Um, like I said, it was a really good product. It's been working out there for a long, long time. Uh, you know, customers love it. They had a great team, great engineers. Um, you know, nice job HPE for seeing that and picking this up. Now, my take on this is uh, really, really pretty positive because essentially what they're doing is they're going to integrate all of this stuff with InfoSight. They're going to have a much better InfoSight uh, as a result of the team, of the product, of the uh, data lake that they're picking up as well. And, um, and all of this is, you know, goodness, sweetness, and light. Um, but there's another angle here that I want to call out. And that is that what we're seeing here is for the, well, I don't want to say the first time, but this is one of the first times that we've seen tr truly the value of analytics data um, being the value of the company. So in other words, um, you know, think about it this way. Like, you know, you can look at this as a product acquisition. You could look at it as a talent acquisition, but just as important is the value of all the data this company has collected over the last few years. And frankly, that's something that we've seen outside of the enterprise tech space, but we haven't seen as much in tech because tech people are just so fixated on the code, on the product. Well, HPE isn't just buying the product here. HPE is buying all this wonderful, wonderful data. And I think that they're going to actually get some, some serious value out of that. So frankly, I'm, um, I'm pretty chuffed here. I, I'm excited to see where this goes. Um, also, you know, there's an AI angle, as you mentioned. Um, you know, I've, as we've been talking about uh, with uh, AI Field Day and on the Utilizing AI podcast, which is a weekly podcast, uh, subscribe every Tuesday. Um, you can, uh, you know, the, the data analytics space is kind of morphing into an AI story. And essentially what used to be 
big pools of data that you would struggle to assess are now big pools of food for your machine learning algorithms. And that is what's going on here. And that's what's going to continue to go on. So from my perspective, again, kudos, HPE, nice acquisition. Um, you know, I'm glad to see that something nice happened with cloud physics because they were good folks. And, um, and it's a big uh, data and AI story. Yeah, and congratulations to those. And, and like you said, I think that the, the big key here is that you're going to start seeing more acquisitions of these companies that have big data lakes and big AI capabilities. Remember when we were all making fun of the fact that Facebook bought Instagram for their user base and not for their picture sharing capabilities? Boy, how did that turn out? I think we're going to start seeing that in enterprise IT more and more because that data is super, super valuable. So if you're a VMware admin, you'd better go patch vCenter right now. Uh, the leader in virtualization has issued software update to uh, first of all, a critical vulnerability that's been announced. Uh, this exploit allows remote file upload and code execution over port 443, that's the HTTPS port, uh, without the need to authenticate. Uh, vCenter 65, 67, and 701 need to be patched right away uh, if possible. And if not, uh, VMware uh, has a workaround that'll keep you from getting exploited until you can patch it. Researchers have announced that uh, scanning for vulnerabilities systems kicked off immediately after the announcement of the vulnerability patch release uh, with between 6,000 and 15,000 servers exposed on the public internet. Um, Tom, what are we looking at here? Well, unfortunately, we're looking at a bunch of people who just had their week ruined because um, they're going to be busy patching vCenter servers. Um, you don't get a 9.8 out of a 10 on the CVE meter by having a trivial bug. I mean, this is remote code upload, remote code execution, no authentication required, which means it's drive-by. And uh, the, the numbers vary depending on whether you check Shodan or, or someone with a little bit more, um, I don't know, insight. But even on the low side, 6,000 vCenter servers that have been exposed to the public internet over port 443, folks, SSL isn't quite, or TLS now, isn't quite that secure. Um, here's the thing. The patches are available. They were released with the announcement because this was a coordinated release. And uh, the fact that they fired up as soon as the patches were available tells you that people were hungry for a, a VMware exploit. But here's the other thing. If you can't patch your vCenter server for some reason, you need to go check out the story in the show notes because there is a workaround and it ain't pretty because it involves some file immutability changes and stuff like that. Um, to get you through until you can do the patch. But this is just becoming more and more of a problem. Remember when Microsoft just used to have Patch Tuesday? And now we've gotten to the point where there's Patch Tuesday for non-critical stuff. And then there's the, you better fix this right now because people are about to break your door down patches. We have got to build better systems that are capable of taking these patches and applying them on a rolling basis so that we are not exposed. Also, kind of goes without saying, but if you have a reason to expose vCenter to the public internet, you damn sure better have some protection in front of it because you're just asking for trouble at this point. I hope that a lot of people now realize that we're no longer living in a world where we can just kind of hope that things disappear into thin air and that security by obscurity is a primary goal. Um, you know, I kind of think about some of the stories that you hear in fiction where, you know, the future battlefields are basically littered with um, you know, people who are professional soldiers because they don't have anything better to do. And that's kind of how cyberspace is right now. Even the most inept hacker has tools and knowledge at their, res at their fingertips that can turn them into a very dangerous weapon. So please patch your vCenter server. As a matter of fact, why don't you just spend the rest of the day figuring out if there are patches for things that are critical that you need to apply anyway? Because I've also heard that there's an exchange patch system going out there that's actively being exploited that you really, really need to be upgrading as well. Um, Stephen, one final story here. Um, back in December, Google fired Temnit Gebru, a well-known researcher that's studying ethics and bias in AI, which is a topic that comes up quite frequently. Um, after 2,700 employees signed a letter of protest and two other leading engineers quit, Google promised that they were going to do better. They then fired the co-lead of the team, Margaret Mitchell, allegedly for mishandling internal files, which seems a little fishy. Uh, Margaret contends that she was a whistleblower and was blocked by publishing by the company. Now, we, you know, this is one of those things where a lot of things look really shady and there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. What's going on here? Because I'm kind of curious to get your take on this uh, with a company as large as Google that in, in, employs a lot of AI researchers. 
Yeah, this is a, um, an interesting story, especially to me. So if, if you've been listening in to the Utilizing AI podcast for the last year, um, you've, one thing that uh, theme that you've heard come back again and again and again is bias in uh, data and analytics and machine learning. And um, frankly, when we say bias, I think that people are biased against bias. Uh, let me just start with that. Um, I think when people hear bias, especially when they see a black woman saying bias, they immediately feel attacked and they feel, oh, you're saying I'm a racist and you're saying that I'm a misogynist and blah, 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 blah. These are academics, folks. That's not what they're talking about. What they're talking about is any kind of bias. And yes, bias affects black and brown people. Bias affects women. Bias affects everyone, and bias is present in every data set. And every, every academic who has studied data and analytics and machine learning and artificial intelligence would say that it is impossible to truly eliminate bias. The answer is to be aware of it and to fight against it, which is frankly what science has been doing for centuries. The reason the scientific method exists is so that scientists can point out biases in data and flaws in data and try to address those flaws. That's basic, you know, I mean, literally, this is freshman level engineer, you know, science uh, and engineering class uh, discussion. And that, so, so what's, what's going on here is uh, essentially um, a company, a big company that has a lot of data and uses a lot of machine learning, hired some really well-known and well-respected folks to be part of an internal team to make sure that they were not falling victim to biases in their data. And pretty quickly it got political. In fact, it got really political, really fast. And I don't blame the researchers for that so much as I blame like the entire universe and all of human experience for that because that's just kind of what people do. Um, people felt that this was uh, basically, uh, you know, liberal PC, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and I can understand why some people felt that. But frankly, the response has been just completely, completely ridiculous. Um, so as you said, um, you know, after uh, proposing a paper, a solid sound academic paper that exposed the risks of very large language models, which again, this is academic stuff here, folks, by a respected academic. Um, Google said, uh-uh, we can't have you post, you can't, you know, we, we can't have that paper come out of Google. Uh, it was the lawyers, uh, blame the lawyers. Um, they said, no, no, we can't have this come out of Google. Um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna squash this paper. You gotta remove your name from it. Um, for example, uh, Margaret Mitchell, uh, one of her papers um, what ended up getting published at, under the name of Sh Margaret Schmitchell, no kidding. Um, because uh, her employers wouldn't let her use her own name on her own research. Well, you know what? It was good research from the looks of it, from everything I can see. And so basically, I think what's going on here is companies are starting to heed the advice of academics, which is, look, you've got to watch out for bias. You've got to look, you know, make sure that you're aware of these issues and make sure that you're tackling these issues. But they really don't like what they hear from these researchers when these researchers come back to them and say, hey, guess what? You built a giant database of faces that doesn't recognize black people. Or, hey, guess what? You, brought, you, know, you built a giant you know, model that uh, you know, has uh, all of you know, human language and all of human knowledge, but you fed it only like Western white people stuff. Um, guess what? It doesn't work. And um, instead of saying, wait, this is a problem, like this is a technical problem, um, I think a lot of people think this is a political problem. Anyway, um, the answer here is to fix the problem. The answer here is to have these people on staff, to listen to them, to let them publish, to take your lumps when it's pointed out that you've done something bad and to move on from that. So essentially that's uh, you know, my take here. And um, you know, Google seems to want to do the right thing, but they seem almost comically incapable of doing the right thing. Um, you know, uh, Sundar Pichai apologized about the whole situation uh, with Tim Nick Gebru. He didn't apologize to her and he didn't say that they did anything wrong because the dude's the CEO of a public company and you know how those people are. But he did apologize and, 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 and you know, the, the, the Google research team, you know, they, 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 you know, tried to start a dialogue about this. But again, 
you know, it's totally half-assed. I've got a suggestion for Google. Here's my suggestion. Hey, Google, why don't you fire all the lawyers? Let's do that. Let's fire all the lawyers and see if we can fix the problem starting with that. How does that sound to you? I, I do want to call out a point here that you made, and I just want to make sure that everybody is clear. You said fix the problem, and I absolutely agree. But you need to know what the real problem is. And the real problem is not researchers telling you that you built bad stuff. The real problem is you being able to accept that you built something that internalizes and enhances the biases that you feel. And I'll be the first to admit it. I have bias. Everyone does, like you said. But I also need people to tell me when I'm inherent or when I'm biasing my decisions, because that's the only way I'll learn to overcome it. If all you do when someone points this out is say, well, you're wrong, or we need to adjust the computer algorithm because obviously you're not seeing it right, then that's kind of one of the things that is the problem. I mean, how many times have we said it? You know, things like AI and ML are really good at showing us patterns that we wouldn't normally be able to see because it has a neutral view of the data and can put the pieces together. Well, if the algorithm is constantly providing you with biased data, maybe the pattern it's trying to tell you is that you have bias and you need to solve for that. Sweeping it under the rug and silencing the people who are trying to bring it up, that's not going to fix the problem. So I, I think you're right, Stephen. I think the problem is not that people are bringing it up. The problem is, is that someone sitting in a very comfy chair in a very expensive suit is saying, well, we can't let anybody see this because what would they think? I don't know. What would they think? Would they think that you need to change? Because if they do, that's the right answer. So yeah, let's, uh, let's take a cue from Demolition. Was it Demolition Man or Back to the Future? You know, the legal system runs much more efficiently now that we've abolished all lawyers. So sorry to all of my lawyer friends out there, but um, we're getting rid of your jobs. Uh, maybe you can go into IT, learn Python. I hear that that's a thing. All right, well, that will just about do it for this episode of The Rundown. Now that we're comfortably ensconced in our soapboxes, we want to thank you very much for joining us. Um, we publish The Rundown every Wednesday at 1230 Eastern Time on YouTube and on Facebook. So keep an eye out for that. You can also download an audio copy of The Rundown in your favorite podcast application of choice. If you uh, try, decide to do that, leave us a review and a rating. Do you like listening to our snarky take on the news every week? Uh, if so, let everybody know because they do look at those reviews if they want to check out what we're doing and gets us a few more listeners, gives us some more stories to take on. Um, Steven, what have you got going on this week that people should be checking out? Well, um, I actually, uh, a couple things, a um, little bit of a twist from the, from the usual. Um, I'm kind of refocusing on doing the checksum editorials. Uh, it, those of you who've heard Tom's uh, Tom Versations editorials, uh, you know, he really does a great job of it. I was kind of jealous. So I decided to do uh, more of these uh, checksum editorials. So you can catch those on gestaltit.com. I'll be publishing one here, uh, you know, at the end of uh, end of the week or end of next week um, that I just recorded. Um, and I'm pretty excited about that. Um, of course, you can also catch the Utilizing AI podcast. Again, every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time, we publish a new episode of Utilizing AI and um, where we bring on people to talk about how, how AI is really being used. And of course, uh, the big news for me is that next week is Cloud Field Day. So Wednesday, Thursday, Friday next week, um, tune in uh, from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, all three days for a lot of great uh, enterprise IT, enterprise tech cloud coverage. And so we've got a bunch of great companies talking about how cloud is coming to the enterprise and the real practical applications of that technology. Uh, as always, we're recording those sessions and you can catch them on uh, YouTube slash Tech Field Day. All right. And uh, I just came off of a week of Networking Field Day. Hopefully you guys tuned in. So <clears throat> if you want to head over to techfieldday.com, you can check out all the videos that we recorded from those sessions. They're all published and live now. Um, we will be uh, posting coverage and other things from the event. Uh, you can also check out our episode of the On-Premise IT Roundtable that published this week. Uh, that was the fate of VMware. What happens now that Pat Gelsinger is out of the captain's chair and the ship is sailing off into waters? Um, we had some great conversation there. You definitely want to check that out. Um, but we'll be releasing more content uh, through the next coming weeks. You definitely want to tune in for Cloud Field Day next week, and we have a lot of great stuff coming up. Um, don't forget to head over to gestaltit.com. Uh, check out some of the articles that we've been writing. I actually just published another one about uh, NVIDIA's DPUs. 
um, that's a hot topic in the networking and storage space. And if you, you want to know what a DPU is, you can check out the article and find out why NVIDIA is kind of leading the market there. Um, but for now, for this episode of The Rundown, for Tom Hollingsworth, Stephen Foskett, the great team here at Gestalt IT and our wonderful, amazing community of enterprise IT professionals, thanks for tuning in. And we look forward to bringing you more great news next week. And have a super sparkly day. Thank you.